Welcome to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. Come, join me as we explore the multifaceted worlds of nursing. Hi there, student nurses. My name is Chris Ulmer Dukanes, clinical instructor teaching medical and surgical nursing. Today, we'll be talking about the management of patients with endocrine disorders. The endocrine system plays a vital role in orchestrating cellular interactions, metabolism, growth, and senescence. This interconnected network of glands is closely linked with the nervous and immune systems, regulating the functions of multiple body organs. Disorders of the endocrine system are common and are manifested as hyperfunction and hypofunction. Thus, nursing interventions are essential in the management of patients with endocrine disorders. First, let's discuss hormones. These are chemical transmitter substances produced in one organ or part of the body and carried by the bloodstream to other cells or organs on which they have specific regulatory effects. And it is produced mainly by endocrine glands. Now let's discuss the different glands of the endocrine system. We have your pituitary gland, thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, adrenal glands, pancreatic islets, ovaries, and testes. First, let's discuss the first source of your hormones. We have your hypothalamus. So it is composed of releasing and inhibiting hormones. So under that, we have your corticotropin releasing hormone. Also, we have your thyrotropin releasing hormone. We have also your growth hormone releasing hormone and gonadotropin releasing hormone. And the action of this hormone is to control the release of pituitary hormones. We also have inhibiting hormone, which is your somatostatin. It inhibits growth hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone. We also have your anterior pituitary gland, under which we have your growth hormone, which stimulates growth hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone, and it is responsible for the growth of bone and muscles, also for protein synthesis and fat metabolism, and it also decreases carbohydrates metabolism. Next, we have your adrenocorticotropic hormone. It stimulates synthesis and secretions of adrenocortical hormones. Also, we have your thyroid-stimulating hormone. It stimulates synthesis and secretion of thyroid hormone. Also, we have your follicle-stimulating hormone. In females, it is responsible for the growth of ovarian follicles and ovulation. In males, this is responsible for the sperm production. Next, we have your luteinizing hormone. In females, it is responsible for the development of your corpus luteum, release of oocyte, and production of estrogen and progesterone. In males, testosterone and development of interstitial tissue of testes. Lastly, we have your prolactin. It prepares female breast for breastfeeding. Next source is your posterior pituitary gland under which we have your antidiuretic hormone, which is responsible in increasing the water reabsorption mechanism by the kidney. Next is oxytocin. It stimulates contraction of pregnant uterus, and it is responsible for milk ejection from breasts after childbirth. Next source is your adrenal cortex. Hormones are mineralocorticoids, mainly aldosterone, it increases sodium absorption and potassium loss by kidney. We also have your glucocorticoids, mainly your cortisol. It affects the metabolism of all nutrients 
and it regulates blood glucose levels, and it affects growth and has anti-inflammatory action and decreased effects of stress. Next, we have your adrenal androgens, mainly the dehydroepiandrosterone, your DHEA, and androstenedione. They have minimal intrinsic and androgenic activity. They are also converted to testosterone and dehydrotestosterone in the periphery. Next is your adrenal medulla. The hormones under your adrenal medulla are epinephrine and norepinephrine. They serve as neurotransmitters for the sympathetic nervous system. Next source is your thyroid gland. Hormones under your thyroid gland are triiodothyronine or your T3. It increases the metabolic rate and also it increases protein and bone turnover. Next is your tyroxine or T4. It increases responsiveness to catecholamines necessary for fetal and infant growth and development. We also have your calcitonin. It lowers blood calcium and phosphate levels. Next is parathyroid glands. We have your parat hormone, also known as your parathyroid hormone, and it regulates serum calcium. Next is pancreatic islet cells. So we have here insulin, which lowers blood glucose by facilitating glucose transport across cell membranes of muscles, liver, and adipose tissue. We also have your glucagon. It increases blood glucose concentration by stimulation of glycogenolysis and glyconeogenesis. Also, we have your somatostatin. It delays intestinal absorption of glucose. Next is the kidney. So we have here your 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D. It stimulates calcium absorption from the intestine. And we also have your renin. It activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system mechanism. Lastly, we have your erythropoietin. It increases the red blood cell production. Next is ovaries. We have your estrogen which affects the development of female sex organs and secondary sex characteristics. Also, we have your progesterone. It influences menstrual cycle and it stimulates growth of uterine wall and it maintains pregnancy. And lastly, we have your testes. We have here your androgens, mainly a testosterone. It affects the development of male sex organs and secondary sex characteristics, and it aids in sperm production. Now let's discuss the negative feedback system. When the hormone concentration increases, further production of the hormone is inhibited. Conversely, when the hormone concentration decreases, the rate of production of that hormone increases. So that is your negative feedback system. Next is your classification of hormones according to structures. So hormones are classified according to amines and amino acids. So we have here examples under that classifications, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and thyroid hormones. Next classification is peptides, polypeptides, proteins, and glycoproteins. So we have tyrotropin-releasing hormone your follicle-stimulating hormone, and your growth hormone. Next, we have your steroids classification. So under that, we have your corticosteroids. Next is your fatty acid derivatives. Under that, we have your eicosanoid and retinoids. Now let's proceed to assessment phase. First is your health history. Although specific endocrine disorders are often accompanied by specific clinical symptoms, more general manifestations may also occur. A thorough health history and review of systems are necessary for diagnosis and management of these disorders. We also have your physical assessment. The physical examination should include vital signs, 
head-to-toe inspection, and palpation of skin, hair, and thyroid. Findings should be compared with previous findings, if available. Physical, psychological, and behavioral changes should be noted. Next, we have your diagnostic evaluation. A variety of diagnostic studies are used to evaluate the endocrine system. The nurse should educate the patient about the purpose of the prescribed studies, what to expect, and any possible side effects related to these examinations prior to testing. The nurse should note trends in results because they provide information about disease progression as well as the patient's response to therapy. So we have here your blood tests, your urine test, and additional diagnostic studies. For your blood test, this is used to determine the levels of circulating hormones, the presence of antibodies, and the effects of a specific hormone on other substances. Next is your urine test. It is used to measure the amount of hormones or the end products of hormones excreted by the kidneys. For the additional diagnostic studies, we have your stimulation test. It is used to confirm the hypofunction of an endocrine organ. We also have your suppression tests. It is used to detect hyperfunction of an endocrine organ. Also, we have your imaging studies. We have your MRI, your CT scan, ultrasound, your PET scan, and dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, or your DEXA. Also, we have genetic screening. It is used to determine the presence of gene mutation that may predispose an individual to a certain condition under which we have your DNA testing, the identification of specific gene associated with endocrine disorders, drug development, and increased understanding of the condition. Now let's proceed to pituitary gland, also known as hypothesis, commonly referred to as the master gland, and it is round, about one half inch, and located on the inferior aspect of the brain. And it is controlled by the hypothalamus. Also, it is divided into anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary. For the anterior pituitary, we have here disorders such as Cushing syndrome. So this is a group of symptoms produced by an over-secretion of adrenocorticotropic hormone, and it is characterized by truncal obesity, moon phase, acne, abdominal striae, and hypertension. Also, we have your acromegaly. So it is a progressive enlargement of peripheral body parts resulting from excessive secretion of growth hormone in adults. Also, we have your gigantism. It is the over-secretion of growth hormone in children. Lastly, we have dwarfism. It occurs with insufficient secretions of growth hormone during childhood, which results in generalized limited growth. Next, let's define hypopituitarism and panhypopituitarism. When we say hypopituitarism, it is the hypofunction of the pituitary gland which can result from disease of the pituitary gland itself or disease of the hypothalamus, and it may result from the destruction of anterior lobe of pituitary gland. However, your panhypopituitarism, it is the undersecretion or hyposecretion commonly involves all the anterior pituitary hormones. Now let's proceed to pituitary tumors. It may be primary or secondary. And we have also classified this as to functional tumors, which secretes pituitary hormones. Also, we have your non-functional tumors, which do not secrete pituitary hormones. And also, we have three principal types. First is the overgrowth of eosinophilic tumors that developed early in life, which results in gigantism. The affected person may be more than 7 feet tall 
and large in all proportions, yet so weak and lethargic that he or she can hardly stand. If the disorder begins during adult life, the excessive skeletal growth occurs only in the feet, the hands, the superciliary ridge, the molar eminences, the nose, and the chin, giving rise to the clinical picture called acromegaly. However, enlargement involves all tissues and organs of the body. For the overgrowth of basophilic tumors, it gives rise to Cushing syndrome, with features largely attributable to hyperadrenalism, including masculinization and amenorrhea in females, truncal obesity, hypertension, osteoporosis, and polycythemia. Lastly, the overgrowth of chromophobic tumors. It represents 90% of pituitary tumors. These tumors usually produce no hormones but destroy the rest of the pituitary gland causing hypopituitarism. Now let's proceed to the medical and surgical management. So we have here hypophysectomy. It is a surgical removal of the pituitary gland through a transphenoidal approach. And this is a treatment of choice in patients with Cushing syndrome. Basically, this procedure is done to remove your pituitary gland. Next is posterior pituitary. So we have here diabetes insipidus or your DI. It is a condition in which abnormally large volumes of diluted urine are excreted as a result of deficient production of ADH or your vasopressin. So that means there is lack or insufficient antidiuretic hormone. For the clinical manifestations, patients with diabetes insipidus has very diluted urine output of greater than 250 ml per hour. And because of that, patient drinks 2 to 20 liters of cold fluids daily due to intense thirst. And for the assessment and diagnostic findings, so we have here your fluid deprivation test. So it is being conducted by withholding fluids for 8 to 12 hours or until 3% to 5% of the body weight is lost. And also measurement of plasma levels of ADH and urine osmolality are done. Next, we have your medical management. So the objective of therapy for your diabetes insipidus is of course to replace antidiuretic hormone. Since the patient has insufficient or deficient of antidiuretic hormone, so we have to replace it with antidiuretic hormone and also to maintain the equilibrium within the body and also to ensure adequate fluid replacement. This is to make sure that the patient receives adequate fluid. Also, we have to identify and correct the underlying pathology. For the pharmacologic therapy, so we give our patient the small pressin or your DDAVP. This is a synthetic vasopressin and it is particularly valuable because it has a longer duration of action and fewer adverse effects than other preparations previously used to treat the disease. We also have your chlorpropamide, diabenes, and thiazide diuretics. It is used in mild form of the disease. Next is nursing management. So we have here physical assessment and patient education are the pillars of skilled nursing management of the patient with a diagnosis of diabetes insipidus. Initially, the nurse reviews the patient history and physical assessment. The nurse is responsible to educate the patient, the family, and other caregivers about follow-up care, prevention of complications, and emergency measures. Now let's proceed to another posterior pituitary disorder, which is syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, or your SIAD. It occurs due to excessive ADH secretions 
from the pituitary gland even in the face of subnormal serum osmolality. So this is the opposite of your diabetes insipidus. So in this disorder, there is an excessive or there is too much of antidiuretic hormone. For the clinical manifestation of your sciad, first we have your concentrated urine. Since the patient retains fluid in the body, so the urine becomes concentrated. And also it retains fluid as well. And because of this, that dilutes the sodium electrolyte in the body, causing dilutional hyponatremia. Now let's proceed to medical management. First is eliminating the underlying cause. For instance, the syndrome may occur in patients with bronchogenic carcinoma in which malignant lung cells synthesize and release ADH. So if that happens, so we have first to eliminate or to treat the underlying cause. Next is restricting fluid intake. Since the patient retains fluid in the body, so it is best that we have to restrict the fluid intake of our patient. Also, we have to administer diuretic agents. This is to enhance the diuresis mechanism of the body so that the excess fluid in the body can be eliminated or excreted. Next is your nursing management. We have to closely monitor the fluid intake and output of the patient. We also have to weigh the patient daily. And of course, we have to monitor the urine and blood chemistries, especially the electrolyte levels of the patient. And of course, we have to monitor the neurologic status. And we also need to give supportive measures to our patient. And of course, we have to educate our patient regarding the treatment, the disease. And of course, this could enhance the compliance of the treatment regimen of the patient. Next is the thyroid gland. So it is the largest endocrine gland. So it is a butterfly-shaped organ located in the lower neck anterior to the trachea. And it produces three hormones which are responsible to control the cellular metabolic activity. So we have your thyroxine, the T4, triiodothyronine, T3, and calcitonin. Also, we have iodine which is an essential element to the thyroid gland for synthesis of its hormones. And these are molecules bound to the amino acid structure of the thyroid hormone. We also have your thyroid stimulating hormone, also known as your thyrotropin. TSH controls the rate of thyroid hormone release through a negative feedback mechanism. In return, the level of thyroid hormone in the blood determines the release of TSH. If the thyroid hormone concentration in the blood decreases, the release of TSH increases, which causes increased output of T3 and T4. We also have a term called euthyroid. It refers to the thyroid hormone production that is normal. Next, we have your calcitonin. It is also known as your thyrocalcitonin. It is secreted in response to high plasma levels of calcium. And it reduces the plasma level of calcium by increasing bone deposition. Thus, the main action of your calcitonin is to decrease the calcium level in the blood by way of returning the calcium to the bone. And that is called your bone absorption. Next, we have your goiter. So these are enlarged thyroid gland due to over-secretion of thyroid hormones. And it commonly occurs with iodine deficiency. Now let's proceed to the types of goiter. So we have your endemic iodine deficient goiter. Most common type of goiter that occurs when the iodine intake is deficient is the simple or colloid goiter. We also have your nodular goiter. 
nodular because of areas of hyperplasia or overgrowth. There is no symptoms that may arise but slowly increase in size, and some may become malignant and associated with hyperthyroid state. For the assessment of your thyroid gland, we have your physical examination. That includes the inspection, palpation, and auscultation techniques. Next, we have your diagnostic evaluation. So these are thyroid tests. First, we have your serum TSH, serum free T4, serum T3 and T4, T3 resin uptake test, thyroid antibodies, radioactive iodine uptake, fine needle aspiration biopsy, thyroid scan, radio scan, or synthes scan, and also we have your serum thyroglobulin. For the nursing implications of the tests, we have here, some factors may alter the test results. So we have to check for allergies to iodine such as your shellfish. So very important to ask this information to your patient because most of the test or diagnostic test require the administration of iodine. So very important to ask information about allergic reaction to iodine or shellfish. Next, medication containing iodine because this could alter the test result as well as agents such as estrogen, salicylates, amphetamines, chemodrugs, antibiotics, corticosteroids, and mercurial diuretics because these agents can also alter the test results. Now let's discuss hypothyroidism. It results from suboptimal levels of thyroid hormone. That means there is deficient thyroid hormone levels in the body. So remember that your thyroid hormone is responsible for the metabolism activity of the body. So that means if you have suboptimal levels of these thyroid hormone, that means your metabolism is affected. So it is caused by Hashimoto disease, which is considered as the most common cause of your hypothyroidism. Your Hashimoto's disease is an autoimmune disease wherein the body cells or the body's immune system destroys the thyroid gland gradually. We also have your atrophy of thyroid gland due to aging, therapy of hyperthyroidism. So some therapies could cause depletion of your thyroid hormones, causing hypothyroidism. We also have your Medications, there are some medications that can cause hypothyroidism, radiation as well, infiltrative diseases of the thyroid, and iodine deficiency and iodine excess. Remember, your iodine is responsible for the synthesis of your thyroid hormone. So if you lack iodine, so your thyroid hormones will not be synthesized. Thus, you will have a decreased thyroid hormone in the body. For the clinical manifestations, so patient might experience extreme fatigue because of decreased metabolism, hair loss, brittle nails, and dry skin. This is the most common clinical manifestation for patients with hypothyroidism. Also numbness and tingling of fingers, hoarseness, menstrual disturbances, loss of libido, subnormal body temperature and pulse rate because of decreased metabolic activity of the body, weight gain without increased food intake also because of decreased metabolic activity of the body. Now let's proceed to myxedema coma. It is a rare life-threatening condition and it is considered as the complication of your hypothyroidism. The compensated state of severe hypothyroidism which the patient is hypothermic and unconscious. So the patient might go into coma. Next, we have your medical management. See, the objectives here in treating your hypothyroidism is of course to restore a normal metabolic state 
by replacing the missing hormone. Since we lack thyroid hormones here, your T3 and T4, so we have to replace them with synthetic T3 and T4 in order to balance the hormones of your thyroid gland. Also, we have here prevention of disease progression and complications. See, we don't want our patient to go into myxedema coma. So we have to manage our hypothyroidism as early as possible. And of course, we have to prevent cardiac dysfunction and also prevention of medication interactions. And of course, we have to give supportive care to our patient. We also have pharmacologic therapy. So we administer synthetic levothyroxine. The brand name for this is Synthyroid or Levothyroid. It is commonly prescribed for treating hypothyroidism and suppressing the non-toxic goiters. So this is a synthetic thyroid hormone. And also we have intravenous and oral forms of your T3 and T4. So basically we are replacing the thyroid hormones here to our patient. For the nursing management, so we have here promoting home and community-based care. So we have to educate our patient about self-care and of course we have to teach them about medication instructions since they will be taking synthetic thyroid hormones. And also we have to educate them about the disease condition and of course the symptoms that they will be experiencing related to their disease condition and of course continuing care at home. Next let's proceed to hyperthyroidism. So it is a common endocrine disorder and it is a form of thyrotoxicosis resulting from excessive synthesis and secretions of endogenous and exogenous thyroid hormone by the thyroid. So it is caused by Graves' disease, toxic multinodular goiter, toxic adenoma, thyroiditis, and excessive ingestion of thyroid hormone. So this is the opposite of your hypothyroidism. So in this condition or in this disorder, there is an excessive amount of thyroid hormone circulating in the body. So first, let's discuss what is Graves' disease, which is one of the causes of your hyperthyroidism. So it is the most common cause of your hyperthyroidism and this is an autoimmune disorder that results from an excessive output of thyroid hormones caused by abnormal stimulation of the thyroid gland by circulating immunoglobulins. So for the clinical manifestations of your hyperthyroidism, we have nervousness, maybe because of increased metabolic activity of the body, emotional hyperexcitability, irritab irritable, apprehensive, this is because of increased metabolic activity as well, abnormal rapid pulse, tolerate heat poorly with unusual perspiration. So you would notice to patients with hyperthyroidism that they have hyperhidrosis. That means they perspire excessively. We also have flushed skin, dry skin and diffuse pruritus, exophthalmos. This is the abnormal protrusion of one or both eyeballs. We also have increased appetite and dietary intake because of increased metabolic rate or metabolic activity in the body. We also have weight loss as well because of metabolic rate and fatigability and of course weakness. We have here a condition called thyroid storm. It is also known as thyrotoxic crisis. It is a form of severe hyperthyroidism, usually abrupt onset. So this is the complication of your hyperthyroidism. If your hyperthyroidism is left untreated, undiagnosed, or if the patient is non-compliant with the medications or the treatment regimen, so it could proceed to thyroid storm. And it is precipitated by stress characterized by high fever, extreme tachycardia, and altered mental state. 
and immediate actions are to reduce the body temperature and heart rate and of course prevention of vascular collapse. For the assessment and diagnostic findings for hyperthyroidism, we have thyroid gland is invariably enlarged to some extent. So the thyroid gland may be soft or may pulsate, and a thrill can be palpated, and brewery is heard over the thyroid arteries. That means that there is an increased circulation in your thyroid gland. And the diagnosis is based on the symptoms, there is decreased in serum TSH, increased free T4, and increased in radioactive iodine uptake. So these are the conditions wherein we can diagnose our patient that he or she is experiencing hyperthyroidism. Next is the medical management. So the treatment depends on the underlying cause. So consists of combination of therapies, so we can administer antithyroid agents, also radioactive iodine, and of course we can perform surgery. For the pharmacologic therapy, so we have two forms of pharmacotherapy. So the use of irradiation by administration of the radioisotopes 131i, this is to eliminate the hyperthyroid state with the administration of sufficient radiation in a single dose. So this decreases the activity of your thyroid gland, thus decreasing the production of your thyroid hormones. We also have your antithyroid medications. This is to inhibit one or more states in thyroid hormone synthesis or hormone release. So examples of your antithyroid medications are your methemazole, tabazole, or your profil thiouracil or the PTU. Next, let's proceed to the surgical management. So we have your thyroidectomy. This is a surgical removal of all or part of the thyroid glands. So we have two types of your thyroidectomy. So we have your total thyroidectomy. This is a procedure that removes your entire thyroid gland. So meaning to say, all your thyroid gland will be removed. We also have your subtotal or partial thyroidectomy. It is a surgical removal of about 5 sixths of the thyroid tissue. So meaning not all your thyroid gland will be removed. Next, we have your nursing diagnosis. So first, we have your imbalanced nutrition less than body requirements. This is due to increased metabolic rate or metabolic activity of the body. We also have ineffective coping, situational low self-esteem, and of course, risk for imbalanced body temperature. So these are the possible nursing diagnoses of patients with hyperthyroidism. And these are the potential complications of your hyperthyroidism. So as what he had mentioned, the patient might experience thyrotoxicosis or thyroid storm if left untreated or undiagnosed or if the patient is non-compliant with the treatment regimen. And also, it can resort to hypothyroidism because sometimes the treatment could cause a huge drop of the thyroid hormone in the body. Now, let's proceed to nursing care. This is directed to improve the nutritional status of the patient, enhance coping measures, improve self-esteem, maintain normal body temperature, monitor and manage potential complications, and of course, promoting home and community-based care by way of educating patients about self-care and continuing care. Now let's proceed to thyroid tumors. These are classified on the basis of being benign or malignant, the presence or absence of associated thyrotoxicosis, and the diffuse or irregular quality of the glandular enlargement. We also have your thyroid cancer. It accounts for 90% of endocrine malignancies. And it is caused by external radiation of the head, neck, or chest in infancy and childhood. And this increases the risk. 
Lesions that are single, hard, and fixed on palpation are associated with cervical lymphadenopathy suggest malignancy. And the treatment of choice is removal of the thyroid gland, either total or subtotal thyroidectomy. For the nursing management of your thyroid tumors and thyroid cancers, we have first is to prepare the patient for surgery and to reduce anxiety. And of course, we have to provide preoperative care and postoperative care. Also, we have to monitor and manage potential complication and, of course, promote home and community-based care. Next, let's proceed to the parathyroid glands. It is situated in the neck and embedded in the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland. So we have here your parathyroid hormones or parat hormone. This is to regulate calcium and phosphorus metabolisms. So meaning, the calcium is increased and the phosphorus is decreased. And the regulation is controlled by negative feedback system. So we have here your hyperparathyroidism. That means there is an overproduction of your parat hormone by the parathyroid gland. And it is characterized by bone decalcification and development of renal calculi kidney stones containing calcium. That means there is an increase of calcium circulating in the bloodstream. So we have your primary hyperparathyroidism. So it occurs two to four times more often in women than in men between 60 to 70 years of age. And it is rare in children younger than 15 years, mostly do not have symptoms. For your secondary hyperparathyroidism, it occurs in patients who have chronic kidney failure and so-called renal rickets as a result of phosphorus retention, increased stimulation of the parathyroid gland, and increased parat hormone secretions. We also have your acute hypercalcemic crisis. So it occurs with extreme elevation of serum calcium levels greater than 13 mg per dl. So your acute hypercalcemic crisis is the complication of your hyperparathyroidism. So it results in life-threatening neurologic, cardiovascular, and kidney symptoms. And rapid rehydration with large volume of IV isotonic saline fluids and calcitonin are recommended. So as treatment of choice for your acute hypercalcemic crisis, we hydrate our patient with large volume of intravenous isotonic saline solution. This is to dilute the concentration of your calcium so that it would not adhere to your blood vessels, to the kidneys, and it will form a calculi or a renal stone that could obstruct the normal flow of your blood vessels as well as in your kidneys. Also, we administer calcitonin because the main function of your calcitonin is to lower the calcium level in the blood. We also have the clinical manifestations of your hyperparathyroidism. First is apathy, fatigue, the patient might experience nausea and vomiting, constipation, hypertension, cardiac dysrhythmias, nephrolithiasis, so that means there is a development of stone in the kidney of your patient. And that stone is composed of calcium that is called your renal calculi, okay? Because of too much calcium in the bloodstream. Next is pathologic bone fractures and deformities. The calcium found on your bone goes to the bloodstream. So that means the bone becomes fragile and can be easily deformed and fractured. Also, patient might develop peptic ulcer and pancreatitis. Now let's proceed to the assessment and diagnostic findings. So there is an elevation of serum calcium levels 
radioimmunoassays can be done to diagnose this condition. Also, bone x-ray to examine if the patient has fractures. Double antibody parathyroid hormone test. Ultrasound, MRI, and thallium scan. And fine needle biopsy. Now let's proceed to medical and nursing management. So for the surgical management, we have your parathyroidectomy. It is a surgical removal of the abnormal parathyroid tissue. So also we have to hydrate our patient. This is to decrease the concentration of calcium in the blood and also mobility. So we have to encourage our patient to move or to walk or to ambulate because uh, activity increases bone absorption. That means the calcium from the bloodstream goes to your bone. Lastly, we have diet and medications. So we have to encourage our patient to avoid food that are high in calcium content. And also we have to encourage them to take their medication. Now let's proceed to hypoparathyroidism. This happens if there is an abnormal parathyroid development destruction of the parathyroid glands such as surgical removal or autoimmune response and vitamin D deficiency. We also have the most common cause which is the near total thyroidectomy because when you remove your thyroid, your parathyroid glands are also removed because that these glands are embedded at the posterior aspect of your thyroid gland and it results in inadequate secretion of your para thyroid hormone or parat hormone. Thus, it would increase the blood phosphate levels and decrease blood calcium levels. So this is the opposite of your hyperparathyroidism. That means in this condition, there is decreased calcium level in the blood. So the patient experiences hypocalcemia. Now let's proceed to your clinical manifestations. This is due to neuromuscular system irritability so your patient is under hypocalcemic state. So patient might experience tetany. So we have your latent tetany. Numbness, tingling, and cramps in the extremities, stiffness in the hands and feet can be experienced by your patient. For your overt tetany, bronchospasm and laryngospasm, carpopedal spasm, dysphagia, photophobia, cardiac dysrhythmias, and seizures can be experienced by your patient. Also, anxiety, irritability, depression, and delirium, as well as ECG changes and hypotension. For the assessment and diagnostic findings, we have positive jawostic sign. Spasm or twitching of the mouth, nose, and eye occurs when a sharp tapping over the facial nerve. We also have your positive Trousseau sign. Carpopedal spasm occurs by occluding the blood flow to the arm for 3 minutes with a BP cough. Also, serum calcium levels, which is low, and as well as bone x-ray. For the medical management, so the goals here is to increase the calcium level to 9 to 10 mg per dl. This is the normal range of your serum calcium level. And to eliminate the symptoms of hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia. For the nursing management, so we have here care of post-operative clients. Calcium gluconate should be available for emergency IV administration and continuous cardiac monitoring and careful assessment. And patient education about medication and diet therapy. For the adrenal glands, so we have here your adrenal medulla. It is located at the center that secretes catecholamines. We also have your adrenal cortex. It is the outer portion of the gland that secretes steroid hormones. For the adrenal medulla, it functions as part of the autonomic nervous system. And it releases catecholamine hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And... Epinephrine is also known as your adrenaline. Now let's discuss catecholamines. 
It regulates metabolic pathways to promote catabolism of stored fuels to meet caloric needs from indigenous sources. And it is responsible for the fight and flight response. So this is also responsible for the sympathetic nervous system responses. Now let's proceed to your adrenal cortex. Adrenocortical secretions make it possible for the body to adapt to stress of all kinds. So we have three types of hormones produced in your adrenal cortex. So we have your glucocorticoids. Example of this is your cortisol. We also have your mineralocorticoids. Example is your aldosterone. And androgens, which is your male sex hormone. So your glucocorticoids, it has an important influence on glucose metabolism. The increased cortisol secretion results in elevated blood glucose levels. For the mineralocorticoids, it has major effects on electrolyte metabolism and it acts principally on the renal tubular and GI epithelium to cause increased sodium ion absorption in exchange for excretion of potassium and hydrogen ions. So, the major natural mineralocorticoid in humans is your aldosterone. So, your aldosterone promotes sodium retention and excretes your potassium or hydrogen ions. Now, let's proceed to your androgen. Its effects are similar to those of male sex hormones. Produce masculinization in women, feminization in men, or premature sexual development in children if excessively secreted, and that is called your adrenogenital syndrome. Now let's proceed to the condition called pheochromocytoma. It is a tumor that is usually benign and originates from the chromaffin cells of the adrenal medulla. The tumor is the cause of high BP. And one form of hypertension that is usually cured by surgery. So this stimulates the release of your catecholamines, such as your epinephrine and norepinephrine. Thus, it produces sympathetic nervous system responses. So the patient might experience intermittent or persistent hypertension and other cardiovascular disturbances, hyperglycemia as well. And also we have here a triad of symptoms. We have your headache, diaphoresis, and palpitations. So as you notice, these clinical manifestations are your sympathetic nervous system responses. Now let's have your assessment and diagnostic findings. So here are the signs of sympathetic nervous system overactivity. So we have your 5H. We have the hypertension, headache, hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating, hypermetabolism, and hyperglycemia. Also, we can perform 24-hour urine collection and plasma levels of catecholamines as a diagnostic test. So we have your vanillin mandelic acid test. Clonidine suppression test as well. CT scan, MRI, and ultrasound can be performed. Also, we have your medical management. So during episodes of symptoms, bed rest with the head of the bed elevated is prescribed. This is to decrease the blood pressure of the patient. We also have your pharmacologic therapy. So we administer alpha blockers, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers. This is to decrease the high blood pressure of the patient. We also have the surgical management. So we have here surgical removal of the tumor with adrenalectomy. So this is the definitive treatment. Hypertension may arise as a result of the manipulation of tumor. And corticosteroid replacement is required for bilateral adrenalectomy. And hypotension and hypoglycemia may occur postoperatively. For the nursing management, so we have to monitor ECG changes, arterial pressures, fluid and electrolyte balance, and blood glucose levels. And of course, we have to promote home and community-based care by way of educating patients about self-care and continuing care. 
Now let's proceed to Addison's disease. So also known as your adrenocortical insufficiency. So it occurs when adrenal cortex function is inadequate to meet the patient's need for cortical hormones. And the most common cause is therapeutic use of corticosteroid, especially if the treatment is abruptly stopped. So that would cause Addison's disease. So the clinical manifestations of your Addison's disease, so this is characterized by low steroid hormones. So patient might experience muscle weakness, anorexia, GI symptoms, fatigue, emaciation, dark pigmentation of mucous membranes and skin, low blood glucose and low sodium, high serum potassium, hypotension, depression, emotional ability, apathy, and confusion. So we have your Addisonian crisis. So this is the complication of your Addison's disease. So also known as hypotensive crisis. So it develops as disease progresses. It may be caused by stress of surgery or dehydration. So characterized by hypotension, cyanosis, fever, nausea, and vomiting, and classic sign of shock. So for the assessment and diagnostic findings, so combined measurement of early morning serum cortisol and plasma ACTH. And the other laboratory findings may suggest hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and leukocytosis or increased WBC. Okay, so that means the patient has an infection. For the medical management, we have Immediate treatment is directed toward combating circulatory shock. So the main problem in your Addison's disease is decreased blood pressure and shock. So we have to restore blood circulation, administer fluids and corticosteroids, monitor vital signs, especially the heart rate and blood pressure, placing the patient in recumbent position with legs elevated, this is to increase the blood pressure of your patient. And also, we have to administer antibiotics because patient might develop infection. For the nursing management, we have to assess the patient, monitor and manage a dysonian crisis, restore fluid balance, improve activity tolerance, and promoting home and community-based care by way of educating patient about self-care and continuing care. For the Cushing syndrome, it is a group of symptoms produced by an over-secretion of adrenocorticotropic hormones. So this is the opposite of your Addison's disease. So here we have an over-secretion or overproduction of your adrenocorticotropic hormone. So commonly caused by the use of corticosteroids medication, and it is characterized by truncal obesity, moon phase, acne, abdominal striae, and hypertension. So for the clinical manifestations, so it is primarily a result of over-secretion of glucocorticoids, your mineralocorticoids, and androgen. So there is an arrest of growth, central type obesity or your truncal obesity, Buffalo hump, heavy trunk, thin extremities, skin is thin, fragile, and easily traumatized, and ecchymosis and striae development. For the assessment and diagnostics, so we have here serum cortisol test, urinary cortisol test, and also we have your low-dose dexamethasone decadron suppression test. So these are the diagnostic tests and laboratory tests in order to diagnose Cushing's disease. We also have your medical management. So we have here transphenoidal hypophysectomy. This is performed if the condition is caused by pituitary tumors. However, adrenalectomy is the treatment of choice in patients with primary adrenal hypertrophy. If the problem is caused by your adrenals, so the treatment here is adrenalectomy. We also have your adrenal enzyme inhibitors. This is to reduce the hyperadrenalism. 
and we also have to taper corticosteroid dosage to minimum if the patient is under corticosteroid treatment. Next, we have your nursing diagnosis. So we have here risk for injury, risk for infection, self-care deficit, impaired skin integrity, and disturbed body image. And of course, we have ineffective coping. Now let's proceed to potential complications. First, we have your Addisonian crisis. Since the patient is receiving treatment in order to decrease the steroid hormone in the body, so it might cause Addisonian crisis. Adverse effects of adrenocortical activity as well. For the nursing care, so we have to decrease risk of injury, decrease risk of infection, we also have to prepare the patient for possible surgery, encourage rest and activity, we also have to promote skin integrity and improve body image, of course we have to improve coping, and monitor and manage potential complications, and of course we have to promote home and community-based care. Now let's proceed to your primary aldosteronism. So excessive production of your aldosterone. It occurs in some patients with functioning tumors of the adrenal gland. What is aldosterone? It conserves body sodium and excretes more potassium and hydrogen. So that means you retain sodium in the body and you excrete potassium and hydrogen. For the clinical manifestations, we have hypertension, hypokalemia because we excrete potassium in the body. We also have alkalosis because aldosterone excretes hydrogen ions so the body becomes alkalotic. And lastly, we have normal or elevated sodium level because aldosterone conserves sodium in the body. Next, we have the assessment and diagnostics. So we have your renin aldosterone stimulation test and bilateral adrenal venous sampling. So these tests are being conducted to diagnose primary aldosteronism. For the medical management, we have your adrenalectomy and we administer spironolactone. Your spironolactone is a drug of choice to control hypertension in primary aldosteronism. And the drug classification of this diuretic is potassium sparing diuretics in order for the potassium to be retained in the body. For the nursing management, so we have to frequently assess for the vital signs, explaining all treatments and procedures, and providing comfort measures. And of course, we have to provide rest periods. I believe this would be the end of our lecture on the management of patients with endocrine disorders. Thank you so much for listening.